Well, welcome everyone. It is, it is another Diatom Web Academy and actually it's going to be our last one for the calendar year, but we are coming back next year. Um, we've already got speakers lined up starting in early January and you can always uh, look at the news page on diatoms.org to keep track of, of upcoming, um, upcoming Diatom Web Academies. Diatom Web Academy is brought to us by uh, the, the taxonomic, Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee that's part of the Society for Freshwater Science as well as uh, our diatoms.org website. We've been meeting every almost every two weeks for the last year, trying to give everyone an opportunity to share what they're doing with taxonomy, with analysis, with assessment, with applications of diatoms, but mostly giving us a chance to come together to um, meet as friends and colleagues in, during our somewhat crazy pandemic year that we're all going through. Um, all of the, all of the uh, Diatom Web Academy recordings are, are, are recorded and you can find those on our YouTube channel. Again, that's an easy link to find at our diatoms.org news page. Um, the, uh, let's see, any last questions? Yeah, if you, if you want to mention where you're, where you're checking in from over in our chat box, people have been uh, doing that. It's always nice to know who's, who's joining us for the Web Academy today. I'm going to turn things over to Sarah. She's going to handle um, introducing Zlatko, and then uh, Sylvia is going to take care of uh, answering any questions that come up in our chat room. Sarah? Thanks, Mark. Um, and I'm really delighted today to introduce our speaker, and I hope you'll in indulge me to give a little personal story um, that, um, about Zlatko and my Macedonian colleagues. Um, so Zlatko, I first met you in 2001 at the North American Diatom Symposium. It was in, in, uh, in Minnesota. It's Minnesota, yeah. In Minnesota. And I, at that point, I w had heard of Anton Uril, who had worked on Lake Oak Ridge. And really, it has been, a, a, you know, held a my in mythic proportions in terms of the work that, that he uh, did there and set the stage and that um, has followed since then. And I really think of Urilge as being the beginning of this Balkan powerhouse that has centered around Macedonia and uh, the work that's been done on diatom evolution. In uh, 2003, I think I obtained a small travel grant to uh, come to Skopje and meet with you. And the, the objectives of my grant were to develop collaborations. And I have to say, that's been one of the really wonderful things about my career of, of meeting you and Sveto Kristik, uh, Teo Nakov, um, Etsy Jovanovska, um, and friendships in, the, in this uh, Balkan powerhouse of Nina Milovska and her father, Luko Milovska, Angel and Bijana. Hello, everybody. And all my other Macedonian colleagues that I have not mentioned. Um, I just have a really uh, special place in my heart for your country. And um, so I'm really delighted that Zlatko Levkov, who is a professor at the St. Cyril and Methodius University in the Republic of North Macedonia will speak to us today about the amazing diatom flora of this tiny country. Thanks, Slatko. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, well, at the beginning, I would like to express my gratitude for this invitation and to give me a possibility to talk about approaches, challenges, and perspectives about the data on flora, but uh, I will speak more on challenges instead of perspectives, since I'm coming from a country that have a lot of challenges and relatively less perspectives. Uh, I'm coming from a country that's name, currently accepted name is North Macedonia, which changed a couple of years ago or some time ago. It represents a very small country. It's about 25,000 square kilometers or 
percent of the total area of Europe. It's a continental. We do not have a coastal uh, zone. But what is interesting that uh, the name of the country might be connected with all geographical directions. For instance, in our name, is, uh, there is a North Macedonia. We are located in the south east of Europe, and we belong to some kind of region that's uh, west called West uh, Balkan. Uh, besides its very small size, uh, the country is uh, very geologically and geomorphologically diverse. Uh, you can find every possible geological substrates. There are a lot of different uh, also minerals. For instance, we have thallium, some rare elements, thallium, arsenic, but even gold, silver. We do not have diamonds still. Uh, but beside this geological uh, diversity, there is also large difference in uh, altitude. So in the southest po point of the Macedonia, the altitude, the average altitude elevation is about 50 meters, and on the northwest, it's about 2,000, more than 2,700 meters. Such kind of uh, geological uh, and altitudinal difference cause also differences in the climate. So there are really large varieties of climate, including Mediterranean, sub Mediterranean, even Boreal, Alpine, to some semi desert climate. And also that cause a large diversity in the water and wet habitat. So based on the last examination of the habitat types in Macedonia, there are almost 90% of water at uh, wet habitats that are listed units. That's a European database for all habitat types. And also uh, and almost 90% of those habitats are present in uh, Macedonia. So we have different kind of Pit box, ferns, uh, mires, alpine ponds, alpine lakes, glacial lakes, and also uh, in country we, we have almost uh, the most of the part of the two important lakes, Ochrit and Prespa, belong to uh, Macedonia. So, having in mind such kind of geological and habitat di diversity. Uh, this might result also to have a large diversity of datums in Macedonia. So, so far we have re registered about 1900 datum taxa. That means personal observation and published data. Uh, those taxa belong to uh, 123 genera or about 72% of the genera that are recorded in Europe are present in Macedonia. So far, based on the personal observations, there are about 1,800 datum taxa and about 100 taxa still remain to be confirmed uh, because not all samples uh, have been uh, examined. So uh, this results uh, based on a large observation of so far about 10,000 samples that are deposited in a uh, so-called Macedonian National Datum Collection that contains about 13,000, more than 13,000 13, samples. Also, there are about 85, maybe more, thousand LM images and about uh, 15,000 uh, SCM images. And from those, there are about uh, 3,000, uh, more than 3,000 plays already prepared. But before I continue to discuss about the challenges in identification of the species, I would like to discuss a little bit about uh, definition of the species. Or so obviously, there is a, a relatively large difference between definition of the people that are paleontologists working with the fossil flora and also with the re recent. So, based on a paleontological description of the definition of the species, it should be some kind of population or unit that exists during a particular time. And what is important, give rise to, a, to another species and then become extinct. On the other side, the people that are working with the mostly uh, recent flora, the main aspect of the uh, species is the sex and also some unique combination of the, of, of the characters. However, uh, I will try to explain the challenges uh, applying these two definitions in our research. One of the first and probably 
most interesting uh, challenge that we call that, that we have is a cyclotella cavitata challenge. When we start a couple of years ago working on a lay concrete uh, core, we received the samples from the deepest part of the core that was aged somewhere about one million years, uh, one million years, and then we found to one species that's uh, similar but quite different to a recent form that called uh, uh, Cyclotella forty. So uh, there were <coughs> sorry several uh, morphological characters like the shape, the size of the central area, ornamentation of the center, central area. Although those two taxa share many ultrastructural characteristics, like uh, position of the foot of portula, uh, positions of the rim of portula, uh, stria, uh, ultrastructure, and many other uh, features. Still. Uh, these morphological features that were previously mentioned, they were also confirmed on uh, uh, ACM. However, uh, then we try to see when those two species appear and disappear for, from uh, the core. And it become interesting story when we saw that uh, Cyclotella cavitata appears about 1 million years ago and disappears about 200,000 uh, 200, years. On the other side, Cyclotella 40 in that period of time become dominant in the uh, plankton of the Lake Ohrid. However, during these observations, we found that this species, Cyclotella cavitata, is uh, really uh, variable in shape, in size, in ornamentation. Uh, then my students sit on the microscope, make about 40,000 additional images. And what is more important, we try to see when particular morphotype uh, appear in the lake and when it, uh, it uh, disappear, for ex uh, become extinct from, from the lake. And finally, we plot uh, those data and we found that in the Lake Ohrid, we have about 25 different morphological entities, taxa or populations uh, that appear and disappear from, from the lake. What is uh, also interesting that somewhere about 600,000 years, this uh, end of the middle place of central transition, we can see that uh, some of the, the, the uh, morphotypes or Taxa have a very short uh, period of time and appearance in, in the core. So they appear and immediately disappear. So this period of time is uh, known as a very dynamic uh, phase of the lake. And also from the biological point of view, this is the change from the 41K to the 100K uh, glacial uh, cycles. Ob obviously such kind of changes in a uh, orbital and global uh, climate have a large influence on the data morphology, not only on the data composition, but also data morphology. So uh, probably this is one of the best uh, examples of so-called punctuated equilibrium in uh, diatoms. Also, if we apply uh, the definition, previous, previous paleontological de definition previously mentioned, Probably we have here about uh, 26 different uh, species. So we, if we describe those probably in the future, it will be forbidden for me and my students to publish any more new species. However, uh, beside this challenge, how to, how to define what is the species here or not, what is the morphological var uh, variation, we have another problem how to uh, use the name or uh, where we should put uh, cy uh, Cyclotella cavitata and 40. When we describe uh, Cyclotella cavitata, it was supposed that uh, it is more closely related to something that's not a real Lindavia that was later described as a Pantrochekiella uh, genus, but uh, we were aware that these species really do not belong to, to uh, the genus Cyclotella, but based on also molecular analysis, it appeared that this taxon is more, or this group is more closely related to, to Pantrochicle instead to, to, to uh, Lindavia. However, 
uh, there are some also beside molecular analysis uh, differences, but there are also some ultrastructural differences between Pantochikila and this complex. And probably in the future, we should discuss a little bit more and probably will be described as a separate uh, genus. However, the centrics are also quite challenging group, uh, especially from Lake Ohrid. Uh, quite recently, we described one species called Tertiarius minutulus that also might be described as a Tertiarius or Lindavia, because uh, in Tertiarius, the, the Rimoportula should be located inside the alveolus here. Uh, Rimoportula is located on a costa that make it a little bit closer to the, to, to the Tertiarius, but not uh, to very close to uh, Lindavia. Uh, so there are many other things that, uh, other characters that we found that important and because of that we put it and describe it as, as tertiarius. There is another species from Lake Ohrid called Cyclotella Lindavia uh, Tinemani that you can find in the same population that Rimo Portola again uh, is not connected with the coast or so distantly so located on the val phase but and distantly from from the alveolus but also in the same population other specimens they have Rimo Portola that is uh, uh, connected with the costa so again these species because do not have uh, Valves Lutoportola might be described or might be tra transferred to Lindavia or to at uh, Terosia. There is another again centric uh, school, probably it will, it will be uh, described in the close future. Uh, in this case, Rimoportola is located on the valve, uh, on the valve mantle, but the Rimoportola is sessile. Uh, all other characters are typical for Pantochikila except the position of the Rimoportola. So again, we have a problem where to put uh, this species should be described as a Pantochikila or Cyclotella. Another interesting uh, thing is that uh, Macedonia during Miocene and Pliocene was uh, land of lakes. There were a lot of lakes and uh, in the last period, most of them are dry and there are a lot of uh, fossil deposits, diatomids. So in many rivers, you can find a large amount of uh, fossil species. Uh, for instance, this river Boturis is in Mar Mariovo, the central part of Macedonia. You can find this nice Tertiarius, uh, Stephanodiscus, and also interesting uh, Cyclotella, for instance, uh, Cyclotella uh, castracani. All of them are fossil, but all of them were uh, observed in the recent samples. Another is uh, River Tresa also in Macedonia. We found quite often Cyclotella iris, but also something, some centric with, in this moment, we do not know its identity, even we do not know the genus name. And what is the, the most interesting, this uh, species, uh, it's not from Macedonia, it's from Bosnia. It was observed again in the recent samples, but it do not possess Futoportula, but it says uh, it has uh, Rimoportula on, on the costa. So we suppose that this taxon is a marine fossil species that uh, due to erosion came in the uh, recent materials in the sediments of the, of the lake. I think it's enough uh, with the centric. So let's start with uh, some challenges with the penates. Uh, one of the most challenging genera during observation was Taurus irella. Especially there are a couple of samples. One is from Pitbok on uh, Yablanica mountain, southwest of Macedonia. In, in that sample, we have at least nine different uh, morph, let's say morphologies uh, that after a couple of thousand of images, you might find uh, some extremes and to try to uh, separate or differentiate uh, those morphological entities. The same is also in Lake Ohrid. There are plenty of uh, different forms of Staurozerella that appear in the lake. And in this moment, we still do not know what is the 
limit or variation of a single species? Do we have really one or nine different species present uh, in the sample? So, uh, so far we were able to identify only seven species that we consider as a widespread. And in this moment, we do not know how many unidentified taxa we have in a uh, datum flora. Fragilaria is uh, not a challenging, it's a real problem because everything looks the same on the bus uh, light microscope. Then I made a couple of images put on the plate and then I found that, that they look a little bit uh, different than other. So in this moment, we are able to identify it about 18 uh, species that we consider as a widespread, but at least more than 20 species or more than 20 morphological entities are uh, not identified because they have larger and smaller difference than, uh, than the type. Uh, I think the Trichosvinia is uh, one of the some kind of forgotten species or neglected uh, neglected uh, gen genus. Uh, in Macedonia, we dis described two species from Trichosvinia from Lake Kohli that we consider as endemic, but also in the waters in the different uh, rivers and lakes, uh, there are two additional unidentified species. So we suppose that uh, Trichosvinia has a much larger uh, diversity than it was uh, currently known. One of the interesting complexes or one of the possibly uh, species flocks that uh, are present in Lake Ohrid is Sanavikla Yakovlevici. This species was described by Hustet, but it's also observed in uh, more or less in the whole Balkan Peninsula. But in Orkley, there are at least six different, let's say, populations or morphological entities uh, that probably will try in the future to see if they are some kind of uh, species, uh, make a, some kind of uh, species flock. What is also interesting in this case, in this complex, that in reality, they do not belong to uh, really Navicula sensu stricto because they have some uh, very specific ultrastructural features, especially inside. There are silica plate, also some hollows uh, at the top of the of the valve. Cellophora is uh, not again not challenging. It's a really problematic genus because it's so diverse and so frequent in all of the samples in all of the habitats. So uh, in this moment. There are more than 100, let's say, taxa that uh, have been observed in Macedonia. Uh, in this moment, I was able almost 40% to identify for almost 40% and about 60% of them are not identified. It's a really challenging uh, and demanding uh, genus and it's a really problem to, to eat easily identify the, the species from, from, from this genus. Another interesting genus that was present with the high variability is Placonese, especially group of Placonese elgenensis or Anglica, Pseudo-Anglica, Abyscoensis group. Uh, we try to see how many species are present uh, in Macedonia and what we see that in most of the cases, there is uh, overlapping between morphological features or numerical features of uh, different species. What we did, with, what we tried to, to, to do is uh, to make some morphometric analysis and then we received some more or less chaotic result probably here, the theory of ha uh, chaos can be applied. That is a li little bit mess or uh, the first observation that we have, that uh, we have more or less extremes in a valve, uh, in the larger valves, but the medium size and smaller valves, there are large overlapping uh, between different species. So again, it's a question about how many species do we have in our, in our sample. Medium, although it's a very nice looking genus, it's quite diverse. Uh, there are more than six, so far more than 60 different species present in uh, uh, our samples. There is one alpine pond, or we call it lake because it's relatively small. 
it's about 500 square meters uh, but it's quite interesting uh, uh, habitat or location because in a single sample we were able to observe about 18 uh, different species uh, in a single sample also what was inter interesting in this uh, let's say lake or pond that we collect about 40 different samples all over the shore and uh, when we compare, when we observe the, the slide, it appears that there is a uh, really large difference uh, in the datum composition between two samples that were separated uh, only two meters. Although most of the samples are clay or uh, mosses, but still the differences between uh, two differences samples were really large and it appeared that this microhabitat, it's a uh, really important for uh, datum, uh, datum diversity. So uh, in one of in some of the samples, particular species were dominant in other species in other were completely uh, absent or present only with uh, one or two valves. Colonies is also very nice looking, but very hard for identification because uh, most of the morphological characters that we use for identification are uh, variable. So in this moment, what I'm trying to do is to establish st stable morphological features that will be used for identification of this uh, group. And especially there is a large problem about colonies because the types are not so very well known or not very well uh, illustrated so so far or not available so it's really challenging uh, how to identify all those uh, taxa present in the in the sample so far we have uh, let's say more than 60 and probably more than 70 different species of colonies present in, uh, in macedonia although confinement olivatium is a widespread taxon however in lake concrete we have more than 10 uh, different let's say morphological entities three of them so far has been uh, described and probably we have seven unidentified uh, population or taxa present in lake okrit one of the interesting uh, species present also in the lake okrit described by hustet it's a gonfonema eroratum even hustet uh, noticed that this species somehow it's an intermediate form between gonfonema and gonfonees because the stria are biserate composed by uh, round circular unimpluted areola but also has a stigma but internally we can see that the structure is more similar to uh, gonfonema instead of uh, gonfonees so this species might be some kind of link between gonfonema and uh, gonfonees. Uh, Hanchia is also quite challenging, quite problematic genus because all of them look uh, on the light microscope, they look uh, the same. So the only difference that can be seen is the numerical features like a stria density, a fibula density or uh valve more or less a valve valve size so the shapes more more or less the same so in this moment there are about 20 different taxa of hanshia present in our samples and probably some, some more will be appear and finally surirela is really hard for identification especially the larger form my former student Alexandra Svetkovsky did a PhD on Surirela and she found that in Ukraine there are more than 20 undescribed unknown species. So uh, Lake Ukraine, for instance, uh, based on her uh, observations, there are about uh, 50 different taxa present in, uh, uh, in the lake. And finally, uh, it's enough of images, uh, some distributional analysis, this is the that the most diverse habitats in Macedonia are Alpine Pond, glass, glacial lakes, uh, peat bogs and ferns, and also Lake Kohrit. Uh, so most of the species that were observed 
came from those uh, localities, but also low land, land uh, wetlands has also some high diversity. Also, uh, extremely rare species and rare species, most of them were observed again in this type of uh, habitats, like in alpine ponds, glacial lakes, or also sub aerial habitats. Also, uh, although we collect a lot of uh, sub aerial habitats, wet mosses, wet, ro wet rocks, uh, it, it's interesting that uh, most of the, sh the species that are present on a uh, single sample uh, that are present only in a, in a single uh, sample. So, uh, considering ecology, most of the species so far found in Macedonia about more than uh, half of them are oligotrophic, but what is also important that uh, the number of common or frequent species, that means that we observe more than uh, about uh, 50 to more than 100 uh, localities, the number is about 500 species, so that means that for the uh, uh, especially estimation of the water quality or ecological status, so many species are not necessary to, uh, to be known. Uh, all the time during my, my presentation, I talk about Lake Kohri, I mentioned Lake Kohri, Lake Kohri, but uh, what we did is not only to record the diatom diversity or to, to see how many species were present in the lake, but also we try to answer some biological questions. So one of the is question of what, what was the origin of the species. So do we have interlocutory speciation or we have some kind of colonization uh, events? Also, if we have uh, some kind of speciation, what was the age uh, of the species and when and why they evolve uh, or appear in the lake? What was the evolutionary pattern? Do we have uh, the same evolutionary pattern for the planktonic species and from uh, benthic species? And also we have a couple of relic species that, for instance, Amphora transylvanica or uh, different uh, diplonase species that were described from Kopech, from uh, by Pantocek, uh, and they are still living in the lake. So the question was also why they survive, how and why they survive in the lake. To answer this, this question, we try to perform a couple of analyses. One was morphological, to try with morphological phylogeny. As I mentioned before, we described two species from Lake Ohrid. Uh, one appear in uh, Lake itself and one appear in the spring areas. And uh, when we try to, based on the morphology, uh, we can see that uh, the species that occur only in the lake is uh, more closely related to the marine species, while the species that occurs only in the spring area is more closely related to other fresh water species. Another interesting uh, data about the, the origin of the species was done a couple of years ago on Aneumastus, uh, it was known that uh, Aneumastus in that, that part of time contains 11 endemic species from Lake Kohrit. And uh, one colleague of mine, HC, tried to isolate them and make a molecular analysis. And finally, what she found was that most of the species do not have any significant differences in, in uh, based on a molecular uh, analysis. All, all of them were clustering uh, together and there was no significant difference, although on the light microscope, uh, they can be relatively easily uh, recognized. So in this case, uh, we suppose that's a typical uh, species flock present uh, uh, in the lake Ohrid. But what is more important, uh, we try to make uh, time calibrated phylogeny and it appears that uh, this, all of those species uh, appear in the lake uh, about 800, uh, between 800 and 600,000 years ago. And did, that was also confirmed by analysis of the core. And again, all those species appear in that, in that uh, period of time uh, in the core. So this is a nice calibration between uh, uh, 
core fossil record and uh, molecular analyze. And the third uh, uh, study was pub published by uh, Elizabeth Rack about uh, surrealoids. Uh, what she found was that uh, surrealites, uh, the sister to the uh, sister sister group to the mono monophyletic group of Campylodiscus or couple of uh, genera that you really described in 1948. Uh, some of uh, this name probably you have heard about Iconella quite recently, but also he described Helizella, Spirodiscus, Plagiodiscus, and Clinodiscus. Some of them are present here. And this second one should be uh, one of the, uh, it's uh, the type of the Econella. The Econella is a little bit torded uh, species. And there is a also not only torsion, but uh, some uh, uh, crossing of valves between uh, hippo valve and epi valve. Uh, however, uh, this story was started, as uh, mentioned, Sarah started by Yuri in 1948 uh, when he described those uh, the new genera, but also what is more important, uh, Yuri provides some kind of time uh, frame for such kind of evolutionary uh, processes. And, uh, and finally, what uh, we try to do is to see what was the Speciation ex uh, extinction rates in the Lake Ohrid. So, do we have in this moment uh, established a plateau or the, the highest number of endemic species, or this will be decrease, uh, decrease or increase? Uh, based on the uh, different type of models, it can be noticed that uh, extinction rates at the early stage of the of the lake dramatically decrease. But on the other side, the speciation rate also uh, significantly increased, starting from 0.3 to up, up to somewhere to uh, 600, uh, 800 to 600,000 uh, years ago. So probably in this period of time, Lake Ukrit become most uh, stable ecosystem and receive the shape that we have now. It's a relatively deep, uh, about 300 meters de uh, deep core. However, in the beginning, uh, the lake was relatively shallower, about 15 to 30 meters. It was very dynamic. And because of that, uh, such kind of uh, dynamic ecosystem uh, influence the speed of speciation and also the speed of uh, extinction. And finally, why we have uh, so many relic species and so many endemic species, the answer of these questions might be uh, might be found in uh, analysis uh, from the from the core. Based on the biochemical analysis, uh, it appears that lay cochrit probably never experienced any major uh, environmental uh, ecological uh, catastrophic or even no desiccation events. Also, uh, there is no evidence for any salinization events like it was observed already in Lake uh, Titicaca. So probably the lake from the, the time of uh, beginning to the recent time, uh, didn't experience any significant uh, environmental impact. However, uh, this lake also has a large resistance and resilience. About 40,000 years, there was a one uh, volcanic eruption in Italy and the volcanic ash uh, was spread uh, through, uh, throughout Europe and was deposited in Lake Prespa and Lake Ohrid, about nine centimeters of tephra layer was observed in Lake Ohrid and about 15 centimeters was observed in Lake Prespa. And uh, the study uh, made by Etsy showed that immediately when this tephra or this volcanic ash uh, came to the, to, the, uh, to the Ohrid Lake, there is dramatic change in uh, datum composition and uh, what is more important that in a period more or less of 1,000, 1,000 years, the datum composition has returned to some kind of, let's say, normal stage. On the other side, Lake Prespa is more uh, sensitive to such kind of disturbances. And uh, this period 
uh, for recovery of lead CRISPR last about 4,000 years. And finally, uh, based on many uh, other molecular analyses on other groups, it appears that Lake Ohrid never experienced any catastrophic event. And what is important that Lake Ohrid, the age of the, most of the species of Lake Ohrid have the same age of the lake uh, itself. So uh, probably Lake Ohrid is the only one lake so far known uh, on our planet that uh, do not experience uh, any catastrophic, uh, catastrophic event uh, compared to Lake Malawi, Lake Titicaca or uh, Lake uh, Baikal. And what we have as a future is to define this 25 or 26 different morphotypes, ecotypes, whatever types, but also to see different speciation process in Placonis, Gonfonema, systematics of Gonfonema, Cymbopleura, Diplones, and we are all the time discussing about the origin of the species in Lake Cochrit, and one of the hypotheses is that Lake Cochrit is just a refugia, and the most of the species should originate from the sister, it's a sister lake, it's called Lake Prespa, and probably they just inhabited uh, the lake and stay there because there are some additional analyses on Lake Presp in the last uh, 150,000 years ago and appears that in that period of time, most of the species known from Lake Ohrid were present also in the Lake Prespa. So uh, just a few slides. Here is Sara uh, on the field trips uh, uh, in Macedonia. This is now springs I'm always standing and not working all, all my colleagues and students are working I'm just uh, standing and watching what they, what they are doing and how they are working however there is some, some still there is some some kind of perspectives uh, that uh, in this moment we are making some kind of validation studies across the country and based on such kind of approach uh, to check uh, and to see if there are some unknown species or important or rare species in uh, especially in the remote areas we can find that some particular habitats are important and valuable for conservation so this is some kind of map that show where the most significant mo most of the species you can see that it's in a mountain area and lake Ohrid and uh, lake prespa so if you like the story about lake prespa and lake Ohrid, uh, i hope that uh, i will see you it was supposed next year but during uh, but because of a corona crisis uh 14 european datum meeting was postponed for 2022 and i hope that i will see you in one and a half year on the Lake Ohrid and to see, is it really so nice and beautiful or is it just an ordinary lake? And finally, I would like to say, to, to express my gratitude first to my technical assistant, Daniela Mitic Kopanya, and I think that I have one of the best technical assistants in the world. This is compared to really uh, Friedel Hinz, uh, uh, the technical or creator, one of the technical creators of the Hurstedt uh, datum collections that helps me a lot at the beginning of my taxonomic work, but also I would like to express my gratitude to my many of my students. I hope there are many, but I will mention some of them like Alexandra, Etsy, Tsatsko, Dushica, Tofe, or maybe, uh, you know, most of them as a uh, Theo. And also my teacher, Dick Parmeseltin, Dick, uh, Paul, Luke, uh, David, Lauren Bals, and Bart. Uh, also to my supervisors, Professor Svetislav Krstic and Pancha Stojanovski, who provide the base of my taxonomic work uh, on diatoms and most of the work uh, presented here was funded by Alexandra from Kumbot Foundation. It was done in Alfred Wegener Institute or in Hustedt Collection, funded by ICDP, Scopsco Project, and also Synthesis. So 
Thank you for your attention and I hope I was on time. Thank you very much, Lako. I, I believe you are very much on time. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and uh, thank you for um, presenting the incredible diversity of diatoms in, in Macedonia. Um, just want to remind everyone, you can uh, enter your questions in the chat box. Um, we're getting some already. Um, I wanted to ask you, Zlako, um, you know, you, you showed a couple definitions of species, um, and I was wondering if you preferred one of those, um, what your thoughts are, and also, um, how do you define endemic species? Well, uh, definition of species, I think that's a topic that is discussed last hundred years, maybe, and probably we'll discuss in the next hundred years. Uh, I really like this uh, paleontological definition because the species is a present uh, in a particular time, before it rise to another species and then become extinct. So this is a really nice uh, definition, and I prefer that one. Uh, considering endemic, uh, it's a little bit challenging uh, how to define, but I suppose it is the species that we observe only in Lake Ohrid, especially in the deepest, deeper part of Lake Ohrid, and have uh, significantly different morphology than already known species. Uh, might be considered as endemic because similar morphologies has not have not been uh, observed in other localities. So I suppose that those endemics are mostly located in Lake Ohrid and par uh, partly in Lake uh, Prespa. So I'm discussing when I'm talk talking about en en endemism, I'm talking about the ancient lakes, not talking about superior habitats or alpine ponds. So I do not think that there is so large diversity or endemism in such kind of uh, habitats. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Sarah. Um, Zlako, the, the temporal change over hundreds of thousands of years in Lake Orid of cycloteloid taxa is amazing. It appears that few taxa are present with one another Instead, there is a continual change from one taxon to another. Am I understanding that correctly, that usually only one taxon is present within a time slice? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, what, what is interesting in uh, this case that uh, particular Morphology is dominant during particular time. Uh, doesn't matter; it's a glacial or interglacial period. When there is a climate change, so transfer uh, transfer from uh, interglacial to glacial or vice versa, immediately four to five different morphology appears in the lake. And after stabilization of the climate, that means about thousand to two thousand years. Uh, usually a single morphotype become dominant and all other become uh, extinct. Again, this morphotype will last couple, in some case, couple hundred thousand of years. And after that, there will be another cl dramatic cl climate change, another four or five different um, uh, morphotypes that will last one or two uh, thousand years. And then again, only one or very few will become successfully conti uh, continued. Uh, so the, in, in this moment, the species that was described also by Yuri is called Cyclotella Hustedi, dedicated to Husted, uh, probably is a direct descendant of uh, Cyclotella uh, cavitata. But uh, also it's nice to mention that before Cyclotella cavitata, there are a couple of other that we call pre-cavitata morphotypes. These are probably initial uh, species that uh, colonize the lake and give rise to many other different uh, 
morphologies uh, in the lake. Okay, great. Um, so we have another question from Tom. Um, you showed us some species flocks. Um, have you identified any um, uh, environmental preferences of those members in the species flocks? Oh, uh, well, most of, most of them are interesting. The species flocks are usually present in the species that occur uh, in the uh, very close to the shore. Uh, so uh, let's say in the, the first five, uh, five meters of the, of the shore. Uh, but uh, usually the species flocks are not present uh, in a taxa that uh, were observed in a deeper part of the lake, for instance, 40, 50, uh, 50, uh, uh, 40, 50 meters. So uh, in most of the cases, for instance, uh, Anomastus or uh, uh, Gonfonema, different type Placonis, all of them are present in the littoral uh, region when those Environmental changes are much more, let's say, obvious or uh, more distinct. So we suppose that, uh, especially in the lake in uh, Anomastus, that the lake was really uh, about one hundred, uh, about eight hundred thousand years. It was relatively shallow, and suddenly it became much uh, deeper and this geological event caused uh, formation of the new habitats and probably those new habitats were inhabited but uh, by those species and start a diversification of the of the taxon so usually most of the most of the species flocks were observed in the species that occur in the littoral and up to let's say sublittoral region Thank you, Zlako. Nice seeing you and great presentation. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from Abhinav. Um, have you cultured some of these uh, diatoms um, for your genetic analyses? Are some of them more difficult to culture than others? Oh, well, there are a couple unsuccessful attempts. Uh, well, planktonic are relatively easy. My, my students, Alexandra and Etsy, did uh, some kind of culturing uh, of those uh, planktonic species, but uh, we tried with <coughs> many benthic species, but in most of the cases, it was not, not successful. Probably what we have a uh, wrong approach, probably that might be one of the, the explanations why it didn't succeed uh, our attempts, uh, because we try to isolate or to, uh, to cult uh, cultivate species that were observed on a 40 meters depth and most of them are relic species and we try to put in, in a small tube probably the environmental conditions are completely different and hopefully in the future we will try to with this uh, species that occur closer to the to the shore the, in the little region and my maybe we will have some some success so far there is no success yeah good luck <laughs> um here is a question from mark um will you continue publish about uh, macedonian diversity in books and other publications or how about a website a web flora uh yeah okay Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm old fashioned. Maybe I'm maybe only old, not fashioned, but I prefer a book. And I would like to publish uh, this work in a book, but uh, I, I'm completely aware that the next generation prefer web and di digital formats. So probably it will be a combination between a book and uh, web page. So probably all of the data will be, or most of the data will be present on the web, but also I prefer and I'm planning to publish the, in a book for, let's say, older people, old fashioned scientists that prefer to, to have a book in, uh, in front of 
their microscopes. Here's another question from Abhinav. Um, can any of these diatoms, you said they were endemic. Um, do you think some of them could be considered threatened or endangered? Could they be put on, like, for example, the IUCN red list? Uh, well, no. Uh, because IUCN has uh, really strict uh, rules how to uh, consider some of those species as uh, endemic. In our case, what, what we are trying to do uh, when we are making uh, valorization of the particular area is to try uh, to see the level of treat of a habitat, not on a species level. Because it's really impossible to uh, make estimation about uh, the population uh, structure, population density, uh, sexual reproduction, and so on. So in this case, datums are not very well, it's not, they're not suitable for IUCN listing, but uh, uh, one of the approaches is uh, this German uh, red list that a couple of other uh, factors might be used for, let's say, and treat to establish or to calculate the treat, the level of uh, treat for a particular species. But I think that in many cases, such kind of uh, flora or red list will not be a Applicative, because in our case uh, Macedonia do not have, for instance, a halophil uh, habitats com compared to Germany that have a lot of uh, saline or brackish water habitats, and those species that are very rare in Macedonia are very c common in Germany or in other other places. So really, it's a, it's a really problematic how to make a to put them uh, on the IUCN red list. And I think we will not be successful for, for that. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Melissa. Um, can you give a bit more detail on, I guess, the general steps of constructing a time calibrated phylogeny for diatoms? Uh, I think that that was done by my student, Elena Jovanovska, and I think that uh, she can write an email to her and she can explain uh, <coughs> what we try <coughs> what we try to do is to find the oldest published record especially for anomasus in the case of the anomasus the uh, most uh, the oldest record of anomasus uh, known in this moment on the planet earth and then uh, we compared to the molecular analysis there, there was some kind of, I don't know, uh, statistical program that was used. But uh, if you are interested in this topic, I think the best thing is to, to, to contact my, my former student, Elena, and she can explain more, more in detail about okay, that. Okay, great. Another question from Mark. Um, in Macedonia, are diatoms currently being used to monitor and assess water quality? Yeah. Uh, there is European uh, framework uh, directive where datums are one of the main indicators for so-called ecological status. And as we are trying to approach unsuccessfully so far to European Union, but still we are trying to, uh, let's say, uh, make this more or less the, the laws uh, the same way as other European countries. So uh, datums are more or less obligatory components for estimation of the ecological status in rivers and lakes in Macedonia. Great. Um, I was curious, um, are, um, you talked about how stable the history of Lake Ored has been over time. Um, and, but there were some periods of climatic changes. Do you think the current uh, changes in climate will be any different from those? 
those previous ones? The response of diatoms or the, the yeah. climate change? Uh, the response well, of diatoms. Well, I do not think so. Uh, and I'm expecting that uh, this present form that we call Cyclotella 40 or Cyclotella uh, Hustede will uh, evolve, uh, evolve to another shape, size, uh, let's say, another paleontol from paleontological point of view, another another species. Uh, so I think the direction, the reaction of the planktonic species are more or less constant. So there are changes in the datum uh, in the production. There are changes changes in uh, uh, datum composition and changes in the valve mor morphology. So that those three uh, response to the climate change. What we can see from recent, uh, let's say from Holocene, again, the same three types of uh, response are present in, uh, in the plankton, especially in the, the planktonic datums in the lake Ocre. So I will expect uh, that Cyclotella 40 will disappear, be become extinct, but will give rise to another, another species. Well, now we are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much, Slako, for answering those questions. Um, would you like to say any last words for us? Hope to see you in Ocrit in 2022. I hope that this crisis, Corona will finish next year and we will be able to see each other somewhere. I do hope that you will come to Macedonia to see the, the, the country. We have a quite nice areas, not only Ocrit, but also there are very nice mountains, uh, very nice uh, glacial lakes, ponds, and so on. And uh, yeah, uh, hope to see you, let's say soon from the geological point of view, it's a very soon, you know, one and a half year. Right, right. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, have a happy holidays, and we will see you all in the new year. <laughs>